I just want to make sure that it's all. Check one. Testing. Check one. We're good? Okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. It's an intimate group today, so you're going to get a lot out of <laughs> this intimate conversation with our author. I want to thank the members of the Programming Communications Committee for their work putting this program together, and to thank the NU Bookstore and the Viking Penguin Group. The libraries, woohoo! The libraries meet the author series, showcases writers whose works address social issues in provocative stories, such as Store Onans, and brings together faculty, students, and staff to debate and discuss these issues and works. Please help to support our programs by becoming a library supporter today. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Stuart Onan. Stuart Onan is the author of 10 novels, including Wish You Were Here. Snow Angels, A Prayer for the Dying, Everyday People, and In the Walled City. Granta named him one of the best young American novelists. A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> a long he's time still ago. young. He's still young. His work, I didn't put the date down. <laughs> They've got to get rid of that on the promo sheet. It's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> His work, Snow Angels, is being made or has been made into a major motion picture ah, and he'll, he can major. talk ah. it is major ah. Ah. starring hello Kate Beckinsale, Kate Beckinsale yes. she's a big she's, she's a big she's a vampire well she's she's a lovely vampire and Sam Rockwell so Stort thank you so much oh, thanks. welcome Stort thank you thank you let me steal the microphone from you here. the lavalier microphone very nice. Everyone can hear? Good? All right. Um, I will open up by reading from Snow Angels, which was my first novel. Uh, I wrote it back in, I think, 1991, so it's been a long, long time. Uh, it's been made into a film by David Gordon Green, the indie director who did All the Real Girls, um, and also a film called George Washington, which is a little, little slow and atmospheric. I have yet to see the film of Snow Angels. It premiered at Sundance back in January. Uh, got very good reviews. Uh, although everyone was uh, sort of afraid of it because it was sad and depressing. Well, I mean, the book is sad and depressing, so I was kind of happy that it's sad and depressing, so he didn't sort of change it that much. Um, it didn't get a, a distribution deal at Sundance, and everyone was very disappointed, but Warner Independent then came along and picked it up. So it's coming out, I believe, March 8th of next year. I had uh, no real contact with David Gordon Green beyond him sending me the screenplay um, very, very early in the process. Uh, Tim O'Brien said of Hollywood, you know, cash the check and duck. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, and in this case, that's basically what I did, which explains, I think, why I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I will, I'm sure. I'll read the very first section from Snow Angels, a very small part of it. It's set in Butler, Pennsylvania, in western PA, where I come from. And I'd never seen that part of the country uh, really represented in literary fiction before. So I decided I wanted to sort of step up and represent. Some chapter one. I was in the band the fall my father left, in the second row of trombones, in the middle because I was a freshman. Tuesdays and Wednesdays after school, we practiced in the music room, but on Fridays, Mr. Shervenik led us outside in our down jackets and tasseled steeler hats and shit kicker boots and across the footbridge that spanned the interstate to the middle school soccer field where, like the football team itself, we ran square outs and curls and a maneuver Mr. Shervenik called an oblique with which, for the finale of every halftime show, we described, all 122 of us, a whirling funnel approximating our school's nickname, the Golden Tornadoes. We never got it quite right, though every Friday Mr. Shevenik tried to inspire us, scampering across the frost-slicked grass in his chocolate leather coat and kid gloves and cordovans to herd us into formation until, in utter disgust, instead of steering a wayward oboe back on course, he would simply arrest him or her by the shoulders so the entire block of winds had to stop, and then the brass and the drums, and we would have to start all over again. Late one Friday in mid-December, we were working on the tornado. Dusk had begun to fill the air, and it was snowing, but Saturday was our last home game, and Mr. Shevenik persuaded the janitor to turn on the lights. An inch or so had fallen during the day, and it was impossible to see the lines. Wrong, 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 Mr. Shevenik shouted. 
When the girl pulling the xylophone slipped and twisted her ankle, he blew his whistle three times, which meant we were to line up for a final chastising pep talk before we could leave. He climbed the three steps of his little wheeled podium and let us stand in silence a minute so we would realize how disappointed he was. Snow piled up in our hair. Beyond the sea of flakes drifting through the highlights came the ringing drone of a tractor trailer's chains on the interstate. In the valley, muffled by a ceiling of clouds, lay the burning grid of Butler, the Black River, the busy mills. We have all worked very hard this year, he said, and paused, breathing steam, as if speaking to a stadium, waiting for his words to circle. Beside me, Warren Hardesty muttered something, a joke, a rejoinder. And then we heard what I immediately identified from my own 22, my father's Mossberg, the nightly news from Vietnam, as gunshots, a clump of them. They crackled like fireworks, echoed over the bare trees on the other side of the highway. They were close. The band turned to them in unison, something Mr. Shervenik could never get us to do. It had just turned deer season, and we all knew the power company had a clear cut through there behind the water tower, as well as the rights to the few overgrown fields carved out of the woods. But all of us with guns knew the land was posted, too close to the road and the school. And the time wasn't right for hunting. The light was gone. We looked to each other as if to confirm our surprise. Mr. Shervenik seemed to understand too, though he was not the hunting type. He praised our dedication, excused us, and instead of leading us back over the footbridge, headed across the empty parking lot for the lit doors of the middle school and stood there rapping on the glass until the janitor let him in. What we had heard was someone being murdered, someone most of us knew, if dimly. Oh. Sad and depressing. Yeah. Uh, and from the screenplay, that is going to be the opening scene of the film, I believe. It's going to show the kid, Arthur, our narrator, who's about 14 at the time, um, in his band uniform, doing all the formations and stuff, and then the gunshots just sort of stopping everything. Uh, I like it. Um, sad and depressing. Uh, <laughs> This next piece uh, is also sad and depressing, but I think I throw a little bit of a spin on it, a little curveball on it. Um, a few years ago, uh, I'd open up my local paper, The Hartford Current, every Sunday and read about teenagers being killed in car crashes. Uh, weekend after weekend after weekend after weekend. It's actually happening, happening again now this fall, which is kind of freaky. Um, but I started just thinking about what happens to these families and what happens to the kids that know these kids. Um, and what are the consequences of this sort of, you know, generic suburban tragedy? And I started thinking, well, there's a, sort of a big story there because it must happen thousands of times a year all over the U.S. Because, I mean, this is the suburbs. It's a car culture out there. So I started thinking about it, how I could write a novel around the car crash. And it seemed just so cheesy and so stock that I knew I had to do something different with it. Um, and I just, it happened to be, you know, October then. I started thinking, oh, what about a Halloween car crash? How about a ghost story car crash? You know, how could I have fun with this? How could I make this sort of swing and sing, and do something different to it? Um, and I started thinking about my favorite Halloween writer of all time, uh, Ray Bradbury, who's just, you know, an early, early influence on me. He wrote a bunch of books back in the 50s, like The Autumn People and The October Country and The Halloween Tree. So he was always sort of circling the holiday. And I wanted to do something like that. So I decided that I would write this car crash thing sort of as a tribute, an homage to Ray Bradbury. And I would use that sort of heavy metaphorical style and sort of I would sing the praises of suburbia the way that he sings the praises of small towns. Because you know, at the time he was writing about small towns, they were all gone. Um, so the book is really sort of a, a, a barbed look at what suburbia is, but it masquerades as a car crash novel and a ghost story. Um, it's a strange little book, I think, and it's called The Night Country, which is again a nod to, to Ray Bradbury. Uh, it opens with two epigraphs. The first is from the American novelist Theodore Wiesner, uh, who wrote a great book called The True Detective, which is now completely out of print. I, I hear they might be bringing it back, but he wrote it in the mid-80s. It is a great, great American novel. Um, it was panned by the New York Times Book Review, and that one review basically killed the book. Um, and Wiesner never quite recovered from it. Um, and the review is just wrong-headed and stupid. Um, 
it's a great book. If you can find it on abebooks.com or at the library or at a used store, uh, go get it because it is a great, great American novel. And the quote from that is, which ties in with the suburbs, is it possible to feel love for a side street without sidewalks, for parked cars and wooden houses? And the second quote is from Kurt Cobain, I hate myself and want to die. Someone usually laughs at that, which is good. It must be very somber here. You know, it must be the weather. Um, this is section is called, again, as a tribute to Bradbury, Something Wicked. And it's written in the form of a spell or an incantation, which I figured makes sense for Halloween. So in this, I'm sort of calling up the demons. In this case, the demon, in fact, is the reader. <laughs> no offense. Uh, Come, do you hear it? The wind murmuring in the eaves, scouring the bare trees, how it howls, almost musical, a harmony of old moans. The house seems to breathe, an invalid. Leave your scary movie marathon, this is better than TV. Leave the lights out, the blue glow follows you down the hall. Go to the window in the unused room, the cold seeping through the glass. The moon is risen, caught in nodding branches. The image holds you, black trunks backlit, one silver ray fallen across the deck, beckoning. It's a romance, this invitation to lunacy, lycanthropy, a dance with the vampire, elemental yet forbidden, tempting something remembered in the blood. Don't you ever wonder? Don't you want to know? Come then, come with us out into the night. Come now, America the lovesick, America the timid, the blessed, the educated. Come stalk the dark back roads and stand outside the bright houses, calm as murderers in the yard, quiet as deer. Come, you slumberers, you lumps, arise from your legion of sleep and fly over the wild woods. Come, all you dreamers, all you zombies, all you monsters, what are you doing anyway? paying the bills, washing the dishes, waiting for the doorbell. Come on, take your keys, leave the bowl of candy on the porch, put on the suffocating mask of someone else and breathe. Be someone you don't love so much for once. Listen, like the children, we only have one night. It'll be fun, trust me, we're not going to get caught. It's a game anyway, a masquerade. This is the suburbs, nothing happens here. So come, friends, strangers, lovers, neighbors, come out of your den with the big screen TV, come out of your warm house and into the cool night. Smell the wet leaves crushed a mush on the driveway, a stale mix of dust and coriander in the wind. It's the best time of year up here, the only season you want from us are pastoral past, witch hunts and wood smoke, the quaintly named dead in mossy churchyards. Never mind that it's all gone. The white picket fence is easy to clean vinyl. The friendship quilts stitched in the Dominican. This is still a new England, garden green, veined with black rivers and massacres. Keep coming, past the last square of sidewalk, past the new developments in their sparse lawns, past the strip malls with the friendlies and the chilies and the gap, the CVS and the Starbucks and the Blockbuster, the KFC and Chinese, their signs dying comets in the night. Traffic signals blinking. Hey, Dave. Come back through Stagecoach Lane and Blueberry Way and Old Mill Place, solving the labyrinth of raised ranches where the last kids, too old but not wanting to grow up just yet, spill from minivans like commandos, charge across lawns for front doors, their bags rattling. The candy is serious here, full-sized Hershey bars and double Reese's cups. No, there's no time to stop, no need. That's in the past. The happy childhood we all should have had, did have, half missed, didn't appreciate. Keep your mask on. Say something now, it would give us all away. We're past that. The grinning pumpkins left behind, the stoops and warm windows, the reaching street lights. Out here, there's nothing but muddy creeks and marshland, stone fences guarding back pasture gone wild. Here, you can still get lost if you want to. So come ride with us, driving the night in circles, the trees startled in our headlights. What, you don't recognize the road? The blind curves and crumbled cut banks twisting so we lean into each other? Intimate, even cozy, laughing as we crush the one on the end against the locked door. Remember the incense of cigarettes, the little attendant rituals. Make your fingers a scissors and bum one. It's okay, just don't pocket my lighter. 
The music's too loud to talk, and there's no need. We're happy, trapped in ourselves in the night. This illusion of endlessness. High school, the freedom of wheels. Be 17 again, and ready for the world to love you. Feel the speed through the floor, the air lipping the windows. We're cutting corners, bowing the yellow line, floating over bumps. A deer, and that would be the end of us. Yet the driver only goes faster, the woods' darkest space, still wilderness. Look around now. Do you remember any of us? Your face has changed. Ours are the same, frozen in yearbook photos. One week, we're history, martyred gods, then forgotten. Our names, you can't even make a guess. It's those kids that died. But you remember what happened, so you know where we're going. Have you seen it? Not just driven by, but have you stopped and gotten out and looked at the tattered bows and ribbons, the plastic crosses and browning flowers, the notes written in girlish script, illegible now, pledging to remember us forever? Have you searched the trunk for scars, amazed at nature, since there's not a mark on it? Of course not. Even if you were from around here, you'd be used to it, maybe even annoyed at the cards and teddy bears, the shameless sentimentality of teenagers. Don't worry. They'll graduate and move away, and then our younger brothers and sisters, off to college and jobs and marriage, leaving our parents, a mother who dedicates herself to a larger cause, a father who turns inward and strange. Do they change into gaudy polyester snowbirds or let the house fall down around them? Whatever. Everyone forgets. You have to. Isn't that true? Isn't that proof that time is merciful and not the opposite? Don't answer. You'll have time to think about it later, an entire night, an eternity. Halloween comes once a year. Can you breathe inside that thing? It's not too hot, is it? But look, we're almost there, where the curve bears down on the crossroads. There's no other car, no bad luck, just the tree, the slick of wet leaves on the road, the romance of speed. It's the time of year that kills us. The police will reconstruct it, pacing off the distance with the limp measuring tape, photocopying the long report for the courts and insurance companies. Someone you love has read it or not read it. The contents life-changing and unimportant. Checks deposited, money spent. From the back seat, you can't see the tree, or only at the last minute if you happen to be back seat driving. Chicken shit. Slow down! There's a second in which we realize we're not going to make the curve. All of us, even the most hopeful. The sound of the road, so constant, disappears, vacuumed into black silence. Light comes back from the trunk as if the tree has flashed its brights, warning us off at the last second. It is a game of chicken. Oh, shit, Danielle says. You feel it because she's on your lap, your arms wrapped around her ribs, her perfumed thinness. Toe, you fuck! Kyle, right beside you. Who? Toe? Kyle? Danielle? See, you've already forgotten. What's my name? What's yours? It's a trick, not a treat, but the tree seems to leap out, seems to drive right at us, wide as a semi. Scream if you want to. After the first few times, you'll realize it's useless. You'll remember us and remember to say goodbye. You'll grow as sentimental as our friends and make this night and this drive last forever, the five of us inseparable. So keep your eyes open. Don't cover your face as we leave the road and shoot through the high weeds, sifted by the grill like wheat meeting a thresher. Remember what happens, how it sounds and smells and tastes. Enjoy the ride. Didn't I tell you? There's a reason we call on you, why this night comes again and again, bad dream within a dream. You think it's torture, but you know it's justice. You know the reason. You're the lucky one, remember? You live. Sad and depressing. But I hope a little bit magical there, a little bit. And that one I said in my, my now hometown of Avon, Connecticut. And I, I had a lot of fun researching it because I use the same roads, the same stores, the same everything. So people in Avon or even Simsbury um, will read it and go, oh look, oh look, oh look. And I used real people and put them in there too. And, had fun with it. It's a very strange way to look at your hometown, to sort of uh, interrogate it fictionally like that and say, what is the meaning of this community? Um, and very strange, I think. I don't think everyone in the community was real happy with it either. But, uh. <laughs>
what are you going to do? Um, this is my latest book, uh, Last Night at the Lobster. It just came out on the 5th. Today's the 7th, so it's been out there for two days. There, so I haven't knocked uh, Stephen Colbert off the top yet, but I'm, I'm looking for him. You know, uh, I will be running for president, and, but only in South Carolina. Uh, let's see, what kind of time do we have here? Ooh, ooh. okay. Um, I'll read two brief sections from this. Uh, this uh, first part talks a little bit about my main character, Manny's sort of romantic situation that he's in right now. Um, he's with Dina, who's pregnant. They don't live together, they're not married, and I think Dina wants some things from Manny that he's not really willing to give. He really doesn't want to sort of commit to her. Um, Manny's old flame, Jackie, is a waitress at the Red Lobster. Um, and on this very, very last night at the Lobster, this could be the last time that he ever sees her. Uh, they've decided to sort of put their romance aside. In fact, they did months ago. Um, uh, Jackie has been with Rodney, her longtime boyfriend. And even when she was with Manny, uh, she was with Rodney there. Um, so it's always been sort of a side thing for her. And Manny can't let go of it. Manny's kind of a romantic. And he's lost a lot of things in this particular year. Not only have they taken the restaurant away from him, uh, but his grandmother, whom he lived with, uh, died earlier in the year. And he's lost Jackie, and he's lost his grandmother, and now he's lost his job. And he's sort of losing his sense of identity and everything here on this very, very last day. It's December 20th, um, so Christmas is coming. And the season's putting a little bit more pressure on him. He still hasn't gotten Dina's gift yet. And he's going to end up going over to the mall during the break after lunch to get this present that he doesn't really want to give to her in a way. So he's sort of caught in the middle here. Uh, what else do you need to know here? Oh, well, this is the prep section. The book is structured just the way that a day at a restaurant is. So here, they haven't opened yet. And they're trying to get everything done before they have to open at 11. Um, and they're shorthanded because a lot of people haven't shown up because they're basically they're getting laid off. They're getting fired. So they're like, fuck that. I'm not coming in. Um, and here he's worried about Jackie. Will Jackie come in? She hasn't come in yet. There are a few people in. And it's getting towards time there. So he's very worried about that. In front, it's so dark out that Roz has turned the house lights on low, giving the place the late night vibe of a cocktail lounge. Dom's still not in. Manny's got to set up the bar and asked Roz and Nicolette to slice lemons and limes while he lugs a couple of buckets of ice from the machine. The Bombay Sapphire's almost gone, and the doers. As he's restocking the bar back, he catches a car crossing the front windows in the mirror, the misdirection confusing, making him swivel his head to see who it is, and then pretend he hasn't, aware that Roz and Nicolette are probably watching him. It's not Jackie's fast and furious arms, boxy gold grand am, so he can stop working up already covered with a dusting. The snow's so dry he can do it with a broom. As he sweeps, he casually peers out over the mall lot, crawling with cars, their lights on to combat the gloom and the snow, falling steadily now, straight down. He doesn't have a coat on, and gradually the cold seizes him, stealing his breath, biting his fingertips, yet he takes his time. What would it mean if Jackie doesn't show up? That all his memories of the two of them are untrue and more shameful than if they'd never happened, because now he has trouble believing them himself. The day they took off and went to Lake Compounds and rode the rides all day and made out on the ghost hunt like they were teenagers. The morning they sat in the waiting room at the doctor's, not talking. By now these scenes have been stripped of their dialogue and motion. All he can recall are still images, her black hair wet and heavy from the shower, her stockings laid over a chair, the glass of water on the floor by her bed holding the light from the window. Yet instead of weakening with time, they've grown more powerful, liable to paralyze him if he dotes on them too long. Part of him, the responsible, smarter part of him that wants Dina be, to be limitlessly happy, hopes she doesn't show up. What could he say to her anyway? Goodbye? Is that it? They tried that months ago. He used to marvel at the fact that out of the millions of people in the world, they'd somehow found each other whether it was by accident or destiny or the result of some logical cascading chain of events. Now, looking out at the snow falling on the darkened cars, he thinks it's an even bigger mystery and, like the lobster, a waste. At least she could have called, he thinks, but even that wouldn't have been enough. What would? 
He trades the broom for a bag of ice melter, strewing the white pebbles like chicken feed, watching them scatter and hop. They crunch underfoot, a different slipperiness, and he thinks it would be fitting on this last day if someone fell and broke a hip and sued the company. If it keeps up like this, the lot will need to be plowed, and he reminds himself to call them when he gets back in. For now, though, he likes being out here alone, salting the walk along the curb, following one wing to the far end where he can watch the, the mall entrance like an advanced scout. A couple times, he thinks he sees a record turn in, but with the distance in the cloud cover, every Japanese coupe could be a Honda, every dark color maroon, until the cars come closer and resolve into disappointing Hyundais and Mazdas, cut-rate imitators. On his way back to the middle, he notices the ice melter beginning to work, a tiny circle opening like a bullseye around each pellet. It's almost time. Even without looking at his watch, he can feel the seconds ticking off like a countdown. He's covering the other wing when a car pauses at the stop sign as if it doesn't know where to go, then keeps coming, following Dom's tracks, and turns in. A big, cheaply painted caprice, probably an old taxi or cop car bought at auction, a real hoopty. He expects it to swing wide and take one of the prime spaces in front, but instead it keeps gliding by as if it's going around the building. He stops salting to watch it pass, standing tall as if he's guarding the place. There are two people in the front seat, a giant black guy driving, and beside him, a tiny brown girl with her hair pulled back and a diamond nose stud, Jackie. Being a nice guy, he raises a hand to wave. For a second, he believes she's looking right at him, her eyes flashing, asking him not to, and he falters, unsure. He freezes in mid-gesture, and that quickly, they're past him and around the corner, dragging a swirling wake of snow, leaving him to contemplate the fresh imprint of their tires. He lowers his hand into the bag and keeps salting, as if nothing's happened, sure that behind the blinds, everyone is watching. He's seen pictures of Rodney on her dresser, but never in person. He's a cricket player, a sought-after bowler around Hartford and even down in the city. He's been kicked out of a couple semi-pro leagues because of his temper, and while Manny can take care of himself, it's been a long time since he wrestled, and he concedes that Rodney could probably kick his ass, and that after all that's happened, he probably deserves it. Having wronged him for so long and so completely, sometimes he pities Rodney even more than he pities himself, until he remembers that Rodney still has Jackie. From what little she's told him, Manny knows he takes whatever under-the-table jobs he can get because he's not legal, and worries that once Jackie gets her degree, she'll drop him for someone educated. He's asked her to marry him, out of desperation, she thinks. Manny can identify. As humiliated as that half-wave made him feel, mostly he was just grateful she'd showed up. He's okay as long as she's near him, as pathetic as that sounds. In a strange way, he and Rodney are brothers, both of them completely at her mercy. And I'm going to read a sort of a, a little closing section. Um, again, it's near Christmas. And when he went out to get the uh, present for Dina, uh, he ended up buying some Powerball tickets for one of his employees. Um, that employee, since, you know, before Manny even got back to the restaurant, left. Um, so he has these Powerball tickets, and he's going to give one Powerball ticket to each of the workers who stayed for the whole night. And they're going to watch the lottery drawing as the very last thing after they close. This is called End of Day. Everything gets tossed. The skewers, the fries, the rice, anything they've stockpiled. The coleslaw goes in the baked potatoes, all the cauliflower, tray on tray of biscuits. Normally they'd save the chowder and gumbo. With oven mitts, he delivers the pots to Leron, who dumps them steaming into the gurgling incinerator. The waste, Manny thinks, imagining how many people a soup kitchen downtown could feed with this. Any vegetables they cut, any sauces they prepared today. He rolls the garbage can over to the region and clears the shelves. The garnishes at the hot plate and their little chafing dishes, the lemon slices and chopped parsley and Parmesan cheese and sour cream. Chuck it in a bucket, Ty says. What have you done with Ty? Manny asks, because usually by this time of night, he's enjoying his chef's privilege of sitting on a stool and watching the others work. I'm like Troy Brown. I'm all about the team. Oh, so I guess that makes me Bill Belichick. Nah, you Romeo Crennel, Ty says, which gets a laugh because he's fat. Who are they playing tomorrow? Rich asks. It's just grab-ass chatter, a way to keep things moving. 
But Manny can't help but remember all the playoff games and Super Bowls they rented a big screen TV for, the thousand dollar pools they taped up behind the bar against company policy and nervous making for him. When the Patriots won that first time on the final play, he and Eddie hugged so hard he almost chipped a tooth. Ty has the kitchen under control, so he goes out front and deals with the bar. There's no need to restock, yet his eyes are automatically drawn to any bottles that are low, his mind making a list he immediately wipes clean. He locks the coolers in the bar back. The liquor stays, but any open mixers like grapefruit juice go straight down the drain. He pitches the olives and cocktail onions, the lemon and lime wedges, the cherries, the strawberries, the plate of margarita salt crusted in circles. In the dining room, Jackie and Roz are using carts to clear the tables, stacking appetizer dishes and collecting bundles of silverware and tea lights and the goddamn stand-up drink and dessert menus he could never keep clean, tearing down this morning's setup in reverse. Manny can't imagine Corbett would try to recycle the salt and pepper, but he'll let the bean counters deal with that. Same for the swizzle sticks and coasters and napkins, though they're probably unsanitary. With a, pang, he realizes, mm, with a pang, he realizes he could have saved the chowder and given it away to any customers who show up tomorrow. Hey, Roz Hall is from halfway across the dining room, pointing to the ceiling. Can I turn this Muzak off? I swear, if I hear this one's for the girls one more time. Go ahead, Manny says. So now there's just the TVs, the back half of the 10 o'clock news nattering as he wipes down the cutting boards and rinses the little sink. The bathrooms are clean, and he takes care of the worst of the foyer and the hall carpet with a push sweeper. He can vacuum the dining room in the morning, but see, he's thinking it's like any other night. There's no point vacuuming or even sweeping up. They're just going to tear the place apart, just as there's no point worrying about inventory. He's already been fired. The coat rack's empty, the host stands squared away, the staff schedule for tomorrow blank. As a tribute, he leaves today's specials on the chalkboard. He boxes the mismatched ornaments in their nests of brittle paper and unplugs the string of lights, coiling it around his elbow like a roadie. The tinsel he pitches. Hey, Jackie says, what are the lobsters supposed to look at now? Each other, Manny says, and a shock of truth shoots through him, afraid she might think he's talking about them. And it is strange to be taking the decorations down when Christmas is just five days away. It doesn't feel like Christmas, even with the snow and Dina's gift in his pocket. He doesn't feel like Christmas. He thinks of Bill Murray and Scrooge, how everything works out for him in the end. Everyone from the TV station singing in front of the cameras, the chick from Indiana Jones kissing him, and Manny can't deny that he'd like that. If one of the Powerball numbers hits, that's the only way it could happen, that last second miracle. Or maybe it already has. Maybe it was just everyone showing up and everyone staying till the end. It's possible that he's missing the whole thing. That's all I got for you. Um, any Q&A at all um, about anything, including the world champion Boston Red Sox there? Um, or there? There are no questions after this season, right? It's just, right. The shilling deal, everybody happy with it? Yeah? yeah? He's not going to break down in July and make us bring up some guy from AAA for two months again, like last year and the year before and the year before? No? It's not a Clemens deal where he's, you know, half a year, six inning pitcher? It's going to be interesting to see what happens to his contract where if he gets one side young or both, we'll get a million dollars. Yeah. How many uh, writers are going to call him and say, listen, I'll vote for you? Well, I'm sure Shaughnessy left a message on his machine as soon as he heard. I'm sure that one vote for the Cy Young, that's crazy, but, uh, uh, I, I, well, it's hard to say if you'd get it. But I, I like the sort of the, the weight, you know, things, the six weigh-ins there. Are they going to show those, like, live on TV? You know, like, The Biggest Loser? Uh, Kurt Schilling, The Biggest Loser. That's him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how aggressive the Sox have been. I mean, re-signing Wake just like that, re-signing Tavares, re-signing Schilling. Uh, the World Series has only been over now for about 10 days. Um, and they've got these guys all locked up. And of course, you know, everyone's worried, Mike Lowell, Mike Lowell, Mike Lowell. I mean, we'll see. Jim? Stuart, I have two, two observations. A, I think you read so well that if well, thanks. you have a uh, audio contract, you, you should be the reader. You are very, very good. Paul, well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Number two. And I'm not related. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. That's okay, Stuart. Uh, the other thing is, 
I am so impressed with the details that you have. But there's one one element that's missing, but you pull it in so nicely, and that is the time of the year. Now, the December 21st is the solstice, the coldest day, the least amount of light. And I noticed that you haven't used light patterns. Uh, maybe there's a reason for it, but your details are so good. It's like you're there. You make us feel oh, thanks. totally there. So I'm sorry. It's not a criticism. It's just oh, no, it's, it's sort of the light patterns that, to me, with snow and solstice might be. Perhaps. Oh, it's 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 there. It's it's you know I, I tend to spend a little sometimes too much time on lighting effects. Um, you know I, I tend to get at times a little too cinematic there. Uh, but yeah, this yeah the lighting is definitely there. And in fact, it, that early section is something like 10:40 in the morning, and they've got the lights on. It's gloomy outside. And through the day, it goes through that. And there's a lot of um, well, it's I'll, I'll read it just a little tiny tiny piece. Whoa. Um, this is from the middle section that uh, I usually read, but it seemed a little long after doing the other two. But uh, Manny's been outside in the snow, snow blowing, um, and he's out there and the wind's blowing around him and it's dark out now and, and all this. And let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, outside the wind cuts through his thin shirt, lacy flakes catch in his eyelashes. The slushy ghost of footprints bleed through the new cover. It's noticeably warmer, the snow heavy as wet cake, crystals sticking together as they fall. He should probably break out the snowblower, but for now he sews handfuls of ice melter, a quick fix. Far across the lot, a big town plow roams the aisles, blades scraping all the way down to asphalt, yellow light wheeling. It peeps as it backs up, then gores forward again, the diesel softened by distance and the veil of snow, almost fog-like, obscuring the mall, a dark block with floodlights burning at the corners like a fort or a prison. He tramps out to the end of one wing, where Dom's car sits in exile, and works back toward the lobster. The illusory movement of the Christmas lights through the front doors, and the glow from the windows, and the candlelit faces of people eating inside, all suddenly, surprisingly beautiful to him. He rests for a moment to appreciate the vision and hears in the hush at a distance the frantic whizzing of a car spinning its wheels. In the stormlight, the restaurant looks warm and alive and welcoming, a place anyone would want to go. It looks like a painting and he feels proud as if this is his work and in a way it is, except it's over, like him and Jackie, lost, gone forever. Is that why he loves it so much? There's still tonight, he thinks. There's still today. Oh. So that's like that super lighting effect where I sort of I, I take time for the long shot and then we sort of zoom in a little bit and we get the dark and the light sort of trapped in there. I always love that. That 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 light or that sort of warm light when you're outside and it's cold and crappy and it's dark. Like when uh, you're walking along and like a bus passes you past midnight and says no service on the front. You know, but it's all lit and warm inside and you're trudging along, son of a bitch. Which which I did last night. And, and that. Uh, anything else on anything? Thank you all very, very much for coming and sharing your lunch hour. Uh, I think we still have some food back here. Uh, thank you. And I will be signing books uh, outside. Okay. <laughs>